our speaker has been doing online community since be, uh, before the web existed for NASA, IBM, eBay, Intuit, and other startups. He's connected people together in consumer games, which he was just sharing with me, B2B, education, developer relations, and he is also the leader in OC Tribe, a San Francisco group that hosts and live streams community manager talks. He lives in San Jose. Now this is funny. He has only one wife. That's good. <laughs> Two daughters and numerous of pumpkins because they are in season. Please welcome Mark Siegel. Wow. Wow. All right, that's enough for me. I'm done. I just wanted that ovation. Um, no, thank you for coming. I am super excited to be here to today talking about something I'm really passionate about, and that is using your community to build better products. So it's good for a couple reasons. One, your community can help you get better products. And two, the people that are involved in that process really enjoy it and really get more loyal and tight to your, to your company. So today I'm going to talk about when is it appropriate to do that, why do you do it, how do you do it. I'll talk a little bit about communicating out to customers. I'll talk about how do you work with product manage management to make it easy on them. And then finally I'll close with an example using Jeremiah's language of a level four company that's doing it all right from the very beginning. So let's get started. A few years ago I worked at a great company Intuit, but the product I supported was terrible. If you know the term NPS, Net Promoter Score, it's a way to measure products. It goes from 100 to negative 100. If your score is 50 or 60, you've got a great product. If it's 20 or 30, you're OK. Our product was negative, so it was a bad product. In addition, we had predatory pricing. So if you didn't cancel your contract in the first one or two months, you wound up paying us two or $300 a month for the next year. That made customers very unhappy, especially when they saw how bad the product was. And then finally, I worked in a call center. And when you called to complain about all this stuff, it would take us 20 or 30 or 40 minutes to answer the phone. So nobody was really happy with what was going on. So this is not a place where you're going to be able to apply this stuff. There are much more basic issues to worry about. A little bit later in my career, I worked for uh, an auto racing game company called Sim Raceway. Sim, if you know auto racing or you know auto racing fans, they're totally passionate. They live it 24-7. We used to give away an $80 wheel for whoever could drive the, drive the most in one day. And every time we did that, people would drive for 24 straight hours to win an $80 wheel. Like, you could have gotten a job to do better than that. Anyway, um, we ran events all the time. And the way we displayed these events was confusing. So one wonderful Monday morning, I came in, and this gentleman, Roy, had written an Android app to make our events easier to digest. So this, when there's that kind of enthusiasm, that's when you can apply these kinds of lessons. OK, I want to tell a story about something happened a long time ago. Does anybody know this guy? Anybody, anybody? OK, his name is Clyde. I'll come back to him. Um, Back in the last century, in 1996, this is what web pages looked like. It was bitmapped. It didn't move or scroll or anything. So it's when I was working at NASA, and we were doing an education project. And we had three orbits of the Hubble Space Telescope to share with K through 12 students. Basically, the students were going to decide what we observed and take part in the planning of it and do the observations. Really cool. Turns out with that number of orbits, you can't really look at stars, so you look at planets. Um, back then, so the planets we had because of the time of year were Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, or Jupiter. Back then, Pluto was a planet. We were all psyched for Jupiter. Jupiter's big and beautiful, a lot of science. We were psyched for Uranus or Neptune, uh, also good science. The kids chose Pluto. I think it had to do with the Disney dog named Pluto. Anyway, um, that was fine. We were going through the process and doing the observations. There were also other curriculum that we had developed, curriculum products. So like one is, if you take a toilet paper tube and you look and you count the number of stars and then you look down there and then you look up there and you do it 12 times and you multiply it by 12, 
you'll um, come up with about the number of stars you can see in your, in your area. So when you do that across the country, this is really before there were collaboration tools. We've had people do this, email the results, and then we graph it out, right? Guess what? People in San Francisco, New York, see less stars than people in Nebraska and Wyoming. But it was really fun to do that. Anyway, the project was going great. The, the, we felt really good about it. And at some point, somebody said, hey, this is Clyde Tumba. He's the man that discovered Pluto. Somebody said, hey, it's Clyde Tumba's birthday coming up. Shouldn't we do something? So it took all of about a minute to say, yeah, of course we should, right? And there were a lot of elementary school students in this project. So a natural thing we did was we had kids make birthday cards, it really big birthday cards, and send them to us. So we got birthday cards. Like, there's this one. Yeah, wow, 90 years. There was a ton of great birthday cards. <laughs> more birthday cards, you know, and then more birthday cards. I mean, we had hundreds of birthday cards. So right around February 4th, which is Clyde Thomas' birthday, we got him together in a classroom with some kids. And you know, there's his wife, and there he is. And he's surrounded by hundreds of birthday cards. And uh, you know, it was, a, it was a really nice experience. He, from all accounts, he's a humble, great man. And so when I'm 90, I would like to spend my birthday surrounded by birthday cards and kids and singing and all that kind of stuff. Turns out that um, that was Clyde's last birthday on Earth. He died over the course of the year. And um, now, years later, I can't remember anything we learned about Pluto. We observed it, we learned science, but it doesn't ring a bell. What rings a bell is Clyde Tumba and how we made a real human difference in his life. And that wasn't anything we did, that was the community coming forth with the idea. So, you know, as other people have mentioned, they have great ideas and you need to learn how to pay attention to them. It doesn't always have to be complicated. I was at a game company called Mind Jolt. It was Christmas time, and we hadn't done anything for Christmas. So a customer said, shouldn't you decorate your site? So we said, sure. We decorated our site, right? <laughs> um, it was fun for the game players, but it was really special for the guy who gave us that idea, and within a week, it was implemented. So um, it's really helpful to get this stuff, to get these ideas. I want to back up a little bit and say um, there's a few guidelines, right? People can email you I those ideas. That's fine. To the degree that you can get those ideas um, in a public place where they're wider and people can say, yeah, I like that idea. I don't like that idea. Let's have a discussion. Hey, what about this? It's better to put it there. There's lots of places you can do that. I mean, you can do it in a simple forum or in Facebook. There's uh, all the community platforms like Lithium and Higher Logic have features built in for ideation. And there's even special platforms where this is the whole purpose, like user voice. So these things can happen anywhere. And then the other thing that's really important to remember is customers will often say, I want this. I want this button. I want that. It's really better to engage in a conversation and find out what their underlying need is. What is their requirement? Because they've leapt to the solution. If you can understand the underlying requirement, then your product team might be able to build a better feature than they've thought of. Um, let's see, is Nicole Banks here? There's Nicole Banks. You want to speak to this woman. She's a smart lady. Uh, I met Nicole Banks in San Francisco. There's a group called OC Tribe where we get together for community manager talks. So Nicole is now working at Synopsys, but then she was at Imperva. And she talked about ways that her product team was involved, or things she did to get product ideas. So the company had something called App Rules. They were looking to build it much better. So Nicole would go online and start discussions about that, ask questions, create discussion around how to make App Rules better. Now, since these were pretty technical, and I don't think Nicole is, she had some of her product managers in the forum with her answering and participating. That doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's great. Another thing Nicole did was she shared the product roadmap. Um, once uh, she invited, I think, 10 or 20 customers, uh, under non-disclosure, she shared with them what the future of the product would be. It was too late in the cycle to make a difference for that roadmap, but the feedback that they got was um, really useful for the next quarter, for the next version of the roadmap. So share that kind of stuff. 
And Nicole summarized it by saying, when you do these things, then customers feel like they're part of something bigger. When you involve them in the product process, then it's partly their product. You know, you're not going to walk away from your product. Um, there's supposed to be a timer in here, but there's not. So somebody's going to have to help me know how much time's left. Um, okay. So not all the things that happen in this space are for everybody. Like, Nicole had a small group to come together to review the product roadmap. A fellow I talked to named John Boyle of Xenos, he does a lot with a customer advisory board. So typically this is five to 15 customers that come together in an extended way over a period of time and give input into product direction, usually a little bit more strategic. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Another way to do this is with beta tests. So if you have a software that's about to come out, find a small group, release it to them, get their feedback on it, and they may find some bugs for you, and go forward. Um, when you're doing this kind of stuff, it's important to remember people's motivations, right? So John talks about uh, in his business community where he badges people on the customer advisory board. When I was at IBM, we also badged leaders in a similar way, and they said it didn't matter, but those badges were built on a crummy um, infrastructure, so it would fail sometimes. So I'd get these notes that say, ah, it doesn't really matter, but I noticed my badge is missing. So people do like badges, not just gamers, but even real adults do. Um, uh, let's see, a uh, few other things about private groups. Um, for in a business setting, if you have early access to the software or in a customer advisory board where you're helping plan, then you have a strategic advantage. You're going to be better at supporting a certain product than other people that are just coming into it new. At Sim Raceway, the game company, we would give people early versions of the cars, a small set of testers. They would take these cars, they would drive them on the, around on the tracks. They were then leaking information about how great the car was, so they got to be cool in the community, being the first ones with it. And then the cut, the, there was a, a energy built up around the release of these cars, so it really served two purposes. Sometimes stuff doesn't work. At Sim Race, we were largely a North American and European company. That, I mean, we were in America, but that's where our customer base was. A man from Brazil came to us and said, hey, we want to do some stuff in Brazil. You know, it was a little challenging because they speak Portuguese. He got some Spanish speakers on, on board, and eventually his idea was to build out this Latin American racing series. Turned out not to work very well for a variety of reasons. But from my perspective, that was just fine. Like, the company got to experiment with trying something new, and this guy got to live out his dream. I mean, his dream didn't work, but it's better than just being told no. So not everything has to work. Uh, not also, community managers are very adept at writing online and getting this information online. Not everything has to happen there. I worked at eBay under a great guy named Jordan Cooney, and we were building a user-generated content platform. Jordan had a lot of money in his budget, so we decided to do an internal fo focus group. We, over the course of a couple of days at lunchtime, we got 110 eBay employees together. Oh, we got 110 eBay employees together, and um, they uh, got um, so they gave us they gave us feedback right there. We paid them $100, so it cost a lot of money. 110 times 100, right? $11,000. Um, but we got live feedback on our product right there. We also it was a user-generated content platform. We had content that was ready to go, um, and then also. Uh, a nice benefit for, for us was eBay is a big company, and because we had paid these people throughout the whole company to do this, we sort of had a buzz, and it was easier to get our product out there. You know, you can also um, pick up the phone and call people if it's if you're really trying to understand what they're getting across. So it's not just online. When you get this feedback, when you get this feedback, it's really important to respond to it appropriately. I was interviewing, I'm looking for work now, so I was interviewing at a job, and it was similar to my Intuit job, but a really good product. The company was going places. I had talked to the hiring manager on the phone. She seemed amazing. I would learn from her. I was really excited about it, and I asked her, well, what about product and community? She's like, um, to be truthful, really the CEO handles that. We don't get involved. Okay, that's fine. 
So I went, well, not exactly fine, but, but I had my red flag. So I went into my interview, talked to four or five people, and at the end, I had a chance to talk with the CEO. So he asked me five or six tough questions. I felt like I did pretty good. He seemed like he wanted to get out of there, and he's like, do you have any questions for me? So probably I should have just asked him a softball question. I was like, don't do it, don't do it. But instead I said, yeah, what about product and community? What do you think about that? So he said, um, well, you know, we get input from the community. There's some good ideas there, you know, a little bit. So he was a little bit dismissive of getting the feedback. So I said, well, then what do you do when people give you good ideas? Oh, we get millions of ideas. I couldn't possibly respond to them. Like, wow. Like, this guy is taking money from these customers. Some of them have been good enough to give them their ideas, and he can't even bother to take the time to respond back. So it, di it didn't work out for us. No worries. Um, it's not easy, necessarily, to do this, because when you respond back, it's nice if you can respond back with, yes, we'll do that. No, we'll do no we won't. Maybe we will. When I was at IBM, it was before the days of software as a service. So the release cycle was typically a, a year long. And in, in that case, before IBM was willing to commit to providing feedback to customers, it took them nine months to organize their product teams in a way that they could actually give this feedback. So it's not always easy. The other really important thing to say is don't be mechanical about it. So in this example, Michelle writes in, the product manager Rufus writes back, oh great, thanks for writing in Michelle, we really value your input. So Michelle's excited, the company cares about her. She writes in a couple of weeks later when she has another idea, she gets the same message back. Hmm, that's weird. Writes in again, gets the same message back. So at this point she realizes nobody's paying attention to anything, they're just sending me the same message. So it's fine to have a template to respond back, but you need to like incorporate the person's idea in there, pretend like you care. I, um, in my last job, I had a customer named Bennett, and Bennett was filled with ideas. And I remember one day I spent two hours reading his messages, trying to figure out what he meant, talking, figuring out if the product could do it or what, and um, you know, I responded back to him. Was it worth my time? I mean, yes, because he was so enthusiastic about doing this, and he was a little bit of a, a special case, and not all of his stuff applied, but plenty of his ideas did apply to the general population. Um, I want to switch to communicating out. This woman's my wife, Linda, amazing wife. She runs an Airbnb at our house, so we have people in and out of our house all the time. As a result of that, she has some budget to spend, and she spends it often improving our house, right? So one day she came to me. We had a crappy old 20-year-old couch. She said, I want to get a new couch. What do you think about this one? Sure, sounds great, right? So two weeks later, new couch comes, gets delivered, wonderful couch. If she had not had that conversation with me first, and I walked into the room, and we had a new couch and no discussion, I would have felt weird. Like, I would, have, I would have eventually gotten into it. It's a nice couch, right? But it feels weird. So that's what you're doing when you change your website and you don't communicate anything out. People log in and it's all different. You don't have to do that. You know, ahead of time, even if there's no chance for them to input into the decision, at least share it so they know what's going to be coming to them. Um, and then product managers will typically hate when you do this. Like, you don't want to make promises like, this feature will be here in three weeks or by this date. You know, make it more inclusive. Say, hey, we're building a big feature. It's complicated. We think we'll have it by then. If you don't have it by then, eventually the company knows it's going to slip. You have those conversations inside your company. So just have them with your customers as well. Share that, and then you're fine. Nobody's going to hate on you for being late if you explain why. Um, now, how are you going to do this for, pro not all product managers are into this idea. Um, Nicole's was, but not all of them are. So when I was at IBM, there they did not really care about the community at all. So what we did was we had a couple of leaders in the community organize a discussion for about four or six weeks on what features they wanted. Remember, this is a release every year or so there'd be a release. So they worked for a period of time, got their ideas together, and then we arranged, and they, it, wasn't, it was three leaders and probably 20 or 30 customers that were contributing. So it came time, we arranged a teleconference for 
the customer leaders to have a one hour call with the product managers. So that was worth their time because it had, it's basically taking the input of a month of effort in 30 people and boiling it down into something that they could use. Um, when I was at Sim Raceway, we had a product manager that also did not want to hear from the community. So what I did for him is once a week, I scheduled a half hour meeting. I would come to him with all the questions the community had raised. Then I would go off and write it up and give them the answers. Like they didn't get them right away, but they got them within a week. So that's a, that's a way to get around it. Another thing we did once this product manager left the company was we had a Google Hangout. We had a Google Hangout with a bunch of our customers and a few people from the product team, and it was powerful. It was just an hour of time, but the customers, this is the racing game company where people love, loved us, so it was just thrilling for them to be on a hangout with us. For the product managers, they didn't talk to the customers in that way, so it was really meaningful. Uh, just the, I, I mentioned OC Tribe earlier where I met Nicole. I'll talk about it again, but I just want to point it out as a great resource for community managers. It's, it's really a meetup in San Francisco, but it's available to all of you through archive talks. There's been world-class talks by um, Nina and, and lots of talks there to go and look at. I want to wrap up um, with a level four company. Uh, Matt Fairchild was a community manager I met at OC Tribe. He went on to form a company called Wave Dash. It's a, it's a fighting game company, like for tournament fighting games. Fighting for everyone is what it's called. So in the description of the company, he says, oh yeah, we're a game maker. We, we bring good talented people together with grassroots community passion. So right in the statement of the company is community. Uh, companies have values, at least in Silicon Valley. We all spend a lot of time in startups making cool values. So maths are really indeed cool. Like the communities are single greatest strength and delighting the communities are single most important mission. So yes, listen to them. In the very beginning, Matt says the first thing he did was he formed a community council or customer advisory board. He had great game players, he had modders, he had people that made content in this space, and he had regular conference calls with them once a month. And what they did was they helped him set direction. So in gaming industry, there's different ways to monetize, there's a lot of passion around that. And uh, he figured out what was the way to go by listening to people. His is a fighting game, so the physics have to feel right. When you throw a punch, it can't feel like you're weightless. So he also worked on, on these kinds of things with the community council. I mean, in his case, he wound up hiring two people from community council to his team, so now he's got to replenish the council. Uh, the game is not coming out till 2018, but for at least two years now, he's been taking various aspects of the game to conventions where gamers go, getting a hotel room, bringing people in, and playing games with them all night and seeing what they think. There's already an existing Reddit. It's got almost 1,100 members. And it's active. Um, the, the ones with the black bars are places where the company has participated. So there's a community talking about this, and the company is, is in there with them. Um, the guy on the right is uh, Adam. The guy on the left is Josh. Adam has a regular series where he interviews people that he works with in his company about what they're doing. So they're really interested in being transparent about what it's like in a gaming company. I've worked in a couple of gaming companies, and watching this video, I learned a ton, right? So they're just there for everybody. And then finally, when the video is done, you can see that little box on the side, hey, Adam, I have a great idea. You should make a character about this. So even when you're just watching a video, they're trying to get feedback from you. So for me, that's a level four company. I believe in this really strongly, and that's where I'll end, saying please get your ideas from your community and make sure your product team implements them. Thank you.